Are you almost ready? Yeah, I'm ready whenever you are. All right, everyone, welcome to the Art of Bit Banging, where we'll hopefully explore some of the uh, deeper aspects of bus communications and embedded systems. Um, we'll try to expand on that more and uh, how you can use it to exploit buses in unique ways, and also just how you can use it as a general tool. Uh, give you some background on myself here. My name's Aaron Weibel. Uh, I work for a company called Quintac Electronics. Uh, most of my job involves writing embedded firmware uh, and, of course, some of the applications that interface to that embedded firmware. Uh, I've done a couple Linux drivers, but uh, not a whole lot on that front, um, so it's mostly along the backside. Uh, of course, the opinions expressed in this presentation uh, do not reflect on Quintech or any of its affiliates. Uh, before we get started here, how many of you guys are familiar with embedded systems or have uh, hacked with them at all? Just a couple out there. Um, how many of you would say you have embedded systems on your network uh, just plugged in? Yeah. <laughs> so this uh, should be somewhat worrisome to you, although uh, one of the good points about uh, you know, that you can take away from this is that you do have to have physical access for these types of attacks um, with bit banging, so you can at least rest secure in that somewhat as much as you can trust your physical infrastructure. Uh, so let's jump in on this. Uh, so first we're going to cover you know, basically what is a bus in general. Uh, we need to know that before we can even discuss what bit banging is. Uh, then we'll go into you know, explaining what bit banging is, why it's useful. Uh, we'll really dig into probably most of the time will be spent on how to actually do some bit banging. And, uh, you know, then we'll look at some example protocols and then some exploits you can use uh, by violating arbitration rules for packets and that sort of thing. So what is a bus? Um, bus is just any... <laughs> any system for transmitting information between two points. Um, the way it's done is you have some kind of medium that has a state associated with it, and by changing or modulating that state in some way, uh, you can communicate information to the other side. Uh, typically, uh, you'll see this with you know copper wires, gold traces, that type of thing. Um, and usually the focus of, you know, the property that you're modulating is the voltage on the bus at any given time. Uh, that is not exactly true of uh, RF protocols and stuff, which we won't really get into here for lack of time. Um, they actually use some other properties like a uh, phase of a wave and things like that. But, uh, you know, if you're interested, just see me after. I can fill you in on some of that. Uh, there's two overall classes of bus that you'll see. Uh, parallel is more for uh, really high-speed high buses uh, that run over a short distance, um, such as you might see on a microcontroller between the processor and RAM. Uh, although actually on modern uh, higher-end processors, you usually even see serial on those as well. But uh, the main difference between parallel and serial is that... Uh, the parallel bus, you have a whole bunch of lines. So, like, let's say you have 64-bit uh, wor you know, words of data that are going to come across. You have to have 64 lines to transmit all those bits in one baud cycle, which is what the parallel bus does. Uh, with serial, you're basically going one bit at a time, and so you can get away with fewer lines because of that. Um, but, you know, we'll look at it, some examples of both as we go on. So what is bit banging? Normally, when you have these buses running between, you know, either the memory and the processor or uh, some external peripheral that you're communicating with, there's a dedicated hardware mo module called a transceiver that sits in between there, and you write your data onto the into the transceiver, and the transceiver takes care of, you know, communicating that information across your lines uh, so that you can get it out on the other side. With bit banging, you just take that same 
uh, you take those same lines and you just grab a hold of them from software. And from software, you use, set the voltage on the lines to uh, whatever it needs to be to communicate that information. So you're taking the transceivers out of the mix entirely. Um, that has yeah, the main distinction for that there. Uh, the, the main method of uh, bit banging that we'll look at is for putting, uh, you know, for, for setting that voltages on the line will be what's called the GPIO registers that you'll find on a lot of embedded microcontrollers. So for the rest of this talk, we'll kind of focus on those. But you know, we can look at some of the other methods uh, a little bit too. Uh, so one of the first you know, uses that you could use bit banging for is just to monitor the state of your lines. Uh, get some, you know, collect all the state transitions, save them into memory somewhere, and then go back and analyze them and figure out what that signal actually represents. Uh, this is probably the easiest use case because it doesn't require any driving on your part. But if you don't know what a bus is, you just want to, you know, get some samples off it, try to figure out what it does. That's a good place to start. Uh, another thing you can do is break certain hardware assumptions. The transceivers know uh, what the protocol allows, and uh, so there's certain things that the transceivers won't allow. For example, on USB, the two main data transmission line, D plus and D minus, uh, yeah, they they can be uh, you know opposite of of each other, or they can be on the same, uh, the same as each other, same voltage as each other, but low. Uh, but one state that's not permitted is for them both to be high at the same time. So uh, that's you know something you can do that'll probably screw up your hub if you do that. Uh, it can definitely mess with the USB traffic. The other thing you can do is just hold those lines low and let not let anything send data on the bus. Um, you can also write data when the protocol doesn't permit you to. For example, uh, with USB, you can, uh, you know, the host drives all the communications. It'll send down some uh, a read request from your device, from the host device, or from the device, and then the uh, data will come back from the device in a response. But if you're bit banging, you don't have to go through the USB transceiver, so you can send your data whenever you want. You don't have to wait for that to go around. Uh, lots of ways you can mess with the protocols by breaking those assumptions. Um, another good use for it is uh, establishing a beachhead, which basically comes after you've gained a remote code execution or something. You know, what's your next step? Uh, you need a way to get information in and out of that system. Uh, so, for example, on a router, if it's, you know, they don't have any kind of debug peripherals uh, like uh, serial or RS-232 on it, uh, if you want to get data out, one way you could do that is by popping off one of those blinking LEDs on the front and uh, bit banging an RS-232 communication in and out of there, uh, which will let you, you know, load your code onto the device, uh, you know, use that to get output about uh, you know dumping keys or whatever you might find on there probing for other vulnerabilities and coprocessors and that sort of thing um, one example of this a couple of years ago I don't know if you guys are familiar with a group called fail overflow uh, they're a hacking team that has worked with uh, all, all the game consoles that have come out over the last probably 10 years or so uh, getting their own firmware on each of them, allowing people to upload their own code. Uh, one of the ways they did that is by after getting you know, some kind of remote code execution, for example, on the Wii, they would take the uh, memory card slot, which has a bunch of GPIO pins on it for communicating with and storing data on the memory card, and they just uh, turned that into a serial port output from the uh, we so that way they could push their programs down and uh, actually figure out how to make a usable exploit against uh, devices so that they wouldn't have to do all the advanced hacks that they went through later to get their data running on there. Uh, similarly for the Sega, I think they mentioned too, they used the DB9 controller ports on the front here for that same sort of purpose. Uh, one other thing you can use it for if you find 
memory chips on the device. Uh, they usually will have some uh, you know, storage of either keys or program code itself. If you want to figure out what's on there, you can pull the chip off and actually bit bang the parallel protocol, which is what's uh, being shown here in this simulated memory chip. Um, the idea is you've got address lines that tell what address you're reading from and data lines that show uh, what data is coming out of that memory when you read it back. The other two are just some control lines. Um, so just by you know putting the address on the address bus, you can read the data back out. Uh, pretty straightforward. Um, there are a lot of hardware devices for doing this, but you usually have to uh, you know, find one that fits this exact chip that you're looking for. It could have uh, you know, some non-disclosure agreements associated with the documentation. So it, there's a lot of times where it's just easier to just write your own ROM dumper for the chip and get the memory off of it that way. All right, so let's start with uh, how to actually go about bit banging now. Um, all GPIOs uh, are controlled by three registers. This is true of every processor that I've ever worked with. Um, they don't all call the registers by the same name. Uh, for example, microchip up there calls it TRIS port and LAT. Atmel uh, DDR pin port. Parallax calls it DEER and OUT. The functionality is really simple. One of the registers controls whether the line's a an input or an output, and the other one controls you know, one you use for reading samples off the line if you want to sample the voltage, and uh, the other lines for actually setting the voltage on the line. So uh, you can find the, these in the documentation for the data sheets for whatever processor you're looking at. You just have to kind of know what you're looking for. Usually, I just uh, we'll use the search feature to find uh, you know the I/O pin section or general purpose I/O section, and uh, you know then just look through for something that looks like the three registers I'm looking for. Um, now because register you know we're, we're talking about one line here and the registers are eight bits on a lot of these. Uh, usually one register will control eight different lines, so you have to. Each bit in the register controls one aspect of one line. Um, so there's three bits altogether that control the direction, the input, and the output of one GPIO line. Uh, so we'll look at how to actually set bits in the registers near next. So in assembly, it's pretty easy. Um, you can define access to the registers just by uh, you know, using a defined macro or, you know, every assembler has their own way of defining symbols. You just got to find it, uh, just give it a name and specify the address. And C, it's a little bit more complicated. You have to actually define a macro with the address uh, associated with it and then cast that address to a pointer and then immediately dereference it. And you always want to include the uh, volatile keyword when you're doing that, and we'll see why here in a minute. Uh, so that, that just kind of sets up how you're going to access these registers from the memory space. So to set an individual bit in a register, you just use a bitwise OR. Um, it's, uh, the, the value you want a bitwise OR with is 2 to the power of whatever bit you're trying to set. So, for example, uh, set bit 0, you would do 2 to the 0, which is 1, um, you know, and so forth. For bit 7, you can see here it's uh, 128 or hex 80 is the value that I'm using to set bit 7 in the register. Uh, likewise, to clear a bit, you just and it with a complement of that. And if you just want to flip a bit without actually having to read it in and know what, the, what it's currently in, what state it's currently in, you can use uh, the exclusive OR and just XOR it with the bit that you're trying to flip. Uh, so I got some examples of doing that here with uh, atmel assembly uh, for each one. You can see I just do a load instruction and OR and then store it back into the register. You know, load from that address, do the OR, store, same thing for all three. Uh, 
they didn't have a exclusive or immediate for the Atmel architecture, so I had to do a separate load there for that, but not a big deal. Uh, this is how you do that in C. Uh, pretty straightforward as well. Um, just using the bitwise operators with the values on the variable that you declared before. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the direction register sets whether it's an input or an output. Uh, when you're in output mode, the write register will, uh, whatever you write to there, it'll drive the line either high or low to that voltage. Uh, with the read register, you uh, will read the state of the line, whatever you have set. Not necessarily what the state of the line is. Something else could be overpowering your processor and pulling it low. But which one it detects is kind of dependent on the processor. When you're in input mode, um, writing to the right register usually will turn on what's called a pull-up resistor. It just kind of keeps the line from floating at some intermediate voltage when nothing's driving it. It'll pull it up high whenever nothing's actively setting anything on the line. And uh, then, of course, in, you can read the state of the line from input mode as well. So here's an example table of the, uh, that mode for bit 7 of this one register that we're looking at. Um, it's pretty much what I explained before, but I just kind of laid it out here in a nice table so it's easy to figure out what you're doing. Now, another problem you have to worry about is uh, the time between setting your states. Uh, a lot of times your processor is going to run a lot faster than you actually want to be changing the line. So you need to add delay in between. Uh, in assembly, that's not difficult. You can either use a block of NOPs, no operations, to take care of that for you. Uh, you know, if you need something that's really long wait, like on the order of milliseconds or something, then you can use a loop, a uh, simple three instruction loop in assembly. In C, it doesn't look that much more difficult. Um, you're defining a function that uh, you know, declares some number and spins in a loop until that number is used up. But we'll see why this can be problematic here in a minute. So the major problem with C is optimization. Um, the compiler likes to think that it's smarter than you when you're writing your code. Uh, so here's some example code that I've written using the techniques that I just described, except I've admitted the, omitted the uh, volatile declarations in all of these. As you can see, I don't have volatiles up here in the declarations of the register. I don't have it in the, you know, the delay value for the loop. And you can see that it takes all this nice code that's set up to just uh, set the, the register into uh, the, the GPIO line into output mode and then write, uh, you know, toggle the line on high and low, high and low with a uh, delay in between. Uh, if you go down to the assembly, the compiler has turned this, all this code here into three instructions. Uh, the baud delay that I had in here, uh, the assembler decided, or the compiler decided that uh, what, I, what I'm doing here isn't really changing the state of anything, and so what I really meant to do there was just return immediately from the function and not wait any time at all. Uh, <laughs> you know, down here there's uh, this wiggle line function. They've decided, okay, I'm going to set uh, the you know the direction of this I/O pin, and you can see they actually uh, use a different instruction than me. They, uh, Atmel has a instruction just for setting bit seven in register A, uh, but then all they do is they come down here to this instruction, which is a jump that jumps to itself. So it just sits in a loop after that and does nothing. What I'm guessing is it, that it did is at first. Uh, realized that I'm doing nothing in this baud delay function and so just decided not to even call that and then it realized that I'm setting this bit and then immediately clearing it and so it didn't need to perform any kind of operation on that. I would argue they sh still should have at least done a clear 
on the right register right after that. Uh, that way, you know, otherwise, if this was set before I entered this function, um, you know, by my C code, no matter what, when I get down here, it should be clear. But, uh, you know, for whatever reason, the compiler thought they shouldn't do that. But let's see what happens when we put the volatile keywords in there. So here, I've done nothing but just add four volatile keys. And now it turns it into these two functions. <laughs> um, this, you know, for the most part does what you would expect. It does some stack managing at the top and bottom. Uh, then you can see here I've annotated it to where it uh, actually allocates the uh, uh, allocates a register to hold my delay count and then loops over it. For whatever reason, it decides that even though it's only holding this register in a stack, it needs to write or only on the register. It decides to write it to the stack, which does nothing because it just immediately reads it back off the stack. <laughs> So it's kind of a waste of several cycles, but what it mostly works. Uh, but then you go over here and you go, what's going on? This doesn't look at all like what my code was doing. And what it actually did is it took this function and inlined it in here in several places. And, uh, you know, for all this, it, it will behave somewhat as you would expect, uh, but it's going to vary from position to position. When I call baud delay, I want it to wait for exactly some fixed number of cycles. Even if I don't know exactly what that is, I want it to be the same for everything. Whereas whenever they start inlining things like this, uh, the actual call time for that baud delay is going to change sporadically throughout your code, which really throws off your timings when you're trying to implement a bus. So the bottom line is, if you compile when you should assemble, you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> so let's look at uh, start looking at some protocols now that we can actually do with this. Uh, you know, synchronous is a type of protocol that has a dedicated clock line. What that clock line does, it's driven by uh, the master on the bus, and it basically just tells the uh, whatever device it's reading from or writing to uh, how fast to send the bits. So whenever the clock pulse goes high, then that means you know send this next bit. And then when it goes low, it's not until it goes high again that it'll send the next bit. So it's just kind of a way of managing that. Uh, there's several protocols like this. Uh, if you're going to start bit bang, I would recommend going with SPI. It's like the uh, simplest uh, protocol to BitBang it has four wires and it's really straightforward. We'll look at an example of it here. Actually, let me jump ahead while I explain this because I have a, a diagram over here. So with SPI, uh, you've got a chip select, which basically just, uh, when that's high, it means that you're not talking to the chip at all. Uh, when you pull it low, that means you're ready to start communications. And then if you're writing to the chip, uh, you'll have a data line that you can set you know, set your bit state on. So in this case, I'm writing a one bit. I set the you know the output line high, and then the clock gets toggled once. It goes high for a one baud, and then low again. And that way, the uh, whatever device it's writing to knows to sample the line whenever that clock goes high. So you know it's getting a one. So you can see here it's getting a one zero one zero one zero one zero, uh, which happens to be the ASCII code for the letter capital U. Uh, if you come over here, the uh, master is actually reading something in. So this is the line that the master reads on, and all it does is pull the chip select low to let the uh, device know that it's talking with it. Then it, uh, the device asserts its first bit, and then the master raises the clock, lowers the clock again, raises it. So you can see going along here, the bit pattern is 1000110, zero, 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 one, one, zero, which I believe is either capital or lowercase a. Uh, if you deco if you you know do that math out and put it into the ASCII table, you'll see that. Um, 
Another type of bus you'll commonly see is called asynchronous. It has no clock line. Both devices just have to have precise enough timing to be able to measure it. Uh, an example of one of those is uh, the RS-232. Are you guys all familiar with RS-232? Okay, so it's no need to go into that. Um, yeah, basically you have a pre-agreed baud rate. Um, the line has some kind of idle state, and then whenever the uh, you begin trans transmitting a packet, it'll pull the line low for one baud cycle. That lets everything get synchronized and start preparing to read the bits. And then you just got to sample the line at regular intervals. Uh, we'll jump ahead and look at that. So here we have an example of an RS-232 sending the same two uh, you know, bytes that we saw on the SPI bus, only now you can see it's encoded on one line using a fixed sample rate. Every time I have one of these dots here, it's where the device is recording a sample. So the first part sends a U, and then, of course, another A character over here. Um, what else can I say about that? I think that's all for that. Um, now, with more advanced protocols, you have a feature called arbitration, and this usually only occurs when you have devices that are sharing the same bus. Uh, such as the CAN bus in your car, you might have multiple, uh, you know, pr chips and sensors that are all around your car that all communicate over the CAN bus. And uh, the way that they all communicate without stepping on each other is they'll uh, they'll basically have to detect whether or not someone else has started writing in the middle of them writing the packet, and they do that by various means which we'll look at here in a second uh, so yeah they'll usually wait for an idle state for some small amount of time uh, before they try to send a packet and then if they have sent a packet and they detect some kind of corruption then they'll stop sending it immediately back off wait a few more microseconds and try to resend the packet um, which as we'll see how you can uh, get around that kind of, how you can exploit that kind of behavior uh, to do obscure things. Um, so for an example, the CAN bus controller that we're talking about, um, it, it, yeah, it waits for about three microseconds. It then sends out a seven to ten bit identifier depending on what kind you're using. And every time it writes a 1, which is line low for CAN bus, uh, it'll resample the line right after writing it to make sure that the line is actually low. If it's not, then it's uh, said to lose arbitration. Uh, one of the neat things about that is that uh, after that arbitration period, it's not generally supposed to detect that. So you can just change the line. If you, as long as you wait till after the arbitration field has been sent, you can uh, toggle the lines up or down to change bits in the packet that's going out. Uh, also, you can. I think I have it on the next slide. No, I guess not. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Also, you can intentionally read like the first six bits of that arbitration field and then realize uh, you know that this is a device that I don't want to be sending packets on the bus right now so then you just corrupt that last bit and it'll drop the packet on the bus and normally that doesn't cause a problem because it'll just retry and uh, you know wait for the bus to be idle retry again but if uh, you're not following those rules such as if you're bit banging CAN bus you can just keep doing that and never let the packet get through <laughs> uh, another thing you can do is just hold both lines low so that it never looks like the bus is idle uh, that prevents things from talking while you don't want them to uh, I can only imagine the kind of damage that you could do to a car by doing this. You probably brick the CAN bus pretty fast, or a lot of the devices on there. Um, should mention that uh, even though technically they're not supposed to be monitoring the line after the arbitration field, a lot of CAN bus monitors 
just use the same method for writing all bits. So in some of them you can't actually change the bits. You can only make them drop packets, but it's still kind of useful. Uh, Ethernet uses a similar scheme to CAN bus, um, except uh, theirs is based around Manchester encoding. Manchester encoding is pretty simple. Uh, you just got a Instead of using one baud to represent a bit, you use two baud's. If it goes, if the line goes from high to low, that's a zero. If the line goes from low to high, that's a one. And uh, the way that the reason they do that is because that ensures that the number of baud timings between a high state and a low state is be always between two and four. So if two packets try to be sent at the same time, they're going to throw off that peak-to-peak -peak timing, and that's going to signal to the device that's uh, reading the packet that uh, there was some kind of packet collision, and then it's, it knows not to acknowledge that packet or to just drop it. Um, so that does mean that for Ethernet, you can't really... Uh, change the bits midstream unless you are synchronized with the bit timings very precisely on uh, whatever you're writing, which I think you can do with an FPGA, but it's a little bit harder to do from a regular processor. Uh, you could probably get away with it with uh, like 10 megabit Ethernet, but if you go higher than that, you're really going to need some processing power to get on top of that. Um, but otherwise, you can make Ethernet fail in pretty much the same way as CAN bus. So here's an example of a Manchester encoded packet over Ethernet. As you can see, I've set the white lines here are the uh, two baud intervals. So you can see some of these go from high to low, and in other ones they go from low to high. That's how it distinguishes your zeros and your ones. Uh, one thing you never want to do is connect Ethernet directly to your GPIO lines. Um, for one thing, the lines aren't necessarily grounded to the same ground that you're grounded to. Uh, I've talked to some of the RF professionals at my work who said they've encountered places where the difference between grounds is 70 volts or more. <laughs> so if you uh, just plug that, uh, the ether one of the Ethernet differential pair lines into your ground, it could just sink so much current through your ground that it burns it out. Um, you can always measure this to make sure that's not the case, but another thing you have to watch out for is uh, a new protocol called Power Over Ethernet, which uh, basically puts about 45 volts across the lines, but it does it to both differential pairs, so you, you don't know uh, which line it's actually y y the, the difference between the two lines is a small percentage, but uh, the actual voltage relative to your ground is very high. <laughs> so there's a couple ways you can defend it against this uh, type of attack. One is just to use faster buses on all of your microcontrollers. Um, the only problem with that is whenever you have a fast bus on a slow microcontroller, you usually have to have some dedicated chip on there that handles the conversion, and then you can just as easily tap that slower bus that interfaces between the two. So it only adds another step of obfuscation, really. Um, if you use on-chip processors for memory for all of your secure storage and keys and things, then you can't just dump the ROM very easily unless they have the data lines exposed. So if you use a controller without data lines, then they can't just dump your memory with bit banging. But other than that, there's not a whole lot else you can do to defend against these kind of attacks except write your code well. Uh, so to wrap up here, we got uh, you know, BitBang is useful just as a general purpose tool for embedded systems, uh, used to dump ROMs, establish a beachhead, uh, really get your information in and out of packets there, uh, just cause buses to randomly drop packets or inject your own or even alter the ones that are already going across there. Um, so with that, I guess we'll go to questions.
Yes. You were talking about having to set up a delay for the bot. How do you determine the value for the delay in order for it to be synchronous? Uh, okay, so the question was whenever you're adding a delay for a bot cycle, uh, how do you know how long of a delay to set? Uh, the answer is there's a couple ways you can do that. Uh, the typical way I, I would do it is uh, if I'm writing an assembly and I know exactly how long each instruction takes to execute, then I can just say what's the frequency of the processor, how you know, multiply that by the number of cycles that I'm eating up with my instructions and compute it that way. Uh, another way, is like if you're writing it in C especially, it's probably easier just to try a number and then see how long that bot is and then um, just ex interpolate to figure out, uh, you know, take, a, take another guess based on that to figure out what the time should be and try that. You can usually get it within uh, two or three tries, you know, narrowed down to about what you're looking for. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, the C optimizations, is there a way to, to turn off all, I mean, have you had any success turning off all optimizations and getting success or was there still too much problem with uh, so the question is, uh, when you is there a way to d turn off C optimizations, and does that cause any problems for you? There is a flag uh, usually on at least on GCC compilers there is to disable the optimizations. Um, the problem is when you disable the optimizations, the C code becomes so bulky that it's almost unusable. Uh, like I showed you that example with just the volatile variable where it had a register that was uh, writing into memory uh, and then reading it right back out and it was only ever needed to be stored in the register. You're just wasting cycles. Yeah. Are we all good then? All right, thanks.